Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Here is what you will find on today's program. John Russell reports on new research about an ancient culture in Turkey that disappeared long ago. Next, Dan Friedel and Katie Weaver tell about concerns international students have about jobs in the U.S. Then, Andrew Smith explains what a party animal is on words and their stories. But first, Brian Lynn tells about Britain's plans for a new digital currency. The British government is taking another step toward launching an official digital currency. British officials said this week they plan to gather public comments on whether the country should establish a digital version of the pound. The decision comes nearly two years after Britain's Treasury and the Central Bank, the Bank of England, confirmed they were considering the launch of a digital currency. If created, a digital pound would be issued by Britain's central bank, not by private companies. The Bank of England would set the digital currency's value. Digital currencies are also known as cryptocurrencies. British proposals for an official digital currency suggest individuals would not hold accounts directly with the Bank of England. Instead, they would hold accounts with private digital wallet providers. Holders of the currency would be able to use it to pay for goods and services electronically. Britain's finance minister, Jeremy Hunt, said in a statement, While cash is here to stay, a digital pound issued and backed by the Bank of England could be a new way to pay that's trusted, accessible, and easy to use. Hunt added that the government is interested in investigating different possibilities for an official digital currency, while also taking steps to protect the finances of users. Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey said all elements of a digital currency system, including privacy issues, need to be considered. Gathering public opinions on creating a digital pound marks the beginning of what would be a profound decision for the country on the way we use money, Bailey said. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak had asked Britain's central bank to examine the possibilities of a national digital currency while he was serving as finance minister in 2021. So far, 11 countries have launched digital currencies. The U.S. Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank have both considered launching official digital currencies. Supporters of such digital currencies say they make digital business easier and less costly. Such currencies can also make the financial system available to people who do not hold bank accounts. But digital forms of currency also present risks, including Internet attacks, privacy concerns, and the danger that they can be misused by criminals. 
The cryptocurrency industry has been hit with a series of problems in recent months. Crypto crashes led to large losses last year, and the collapse of crypto company FTX in November led to fraud charges against FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried. Former Bank of England Governor Mervyn King recently said he thinks a digital pound would have risks, but no obvious benefits. King, who is currently a member of Britain's House of Lords, added that state-backed digital currencies may be useful in countries that do not have effective banking systems. But he said he does not believe this is the case in Britain. We need to be selective and not driven by a misplaced enthusiasm for all things crypto, King said. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, here is John Russell with a report on the ancient Hittite culture and how it might have been affected by the climate. Over 3,000 years ago, several important civilizations in the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean collapsed or decreased in power. This event is called the Bronze Age Collapse. One of the strongest to disappear was the Hittite Empire in what is now Turkey and parts of Syria and Iraq. Researchers recently offered new ideas about the Hittite collapse. An examination of trees alive at the time showed three years of too little rainfall or severe drought. The drought may have caused crop failures, hunger, and political problems. The Hittites had their capital Hattusa in Turkey's central Anatolia. At the time, they were one of the ancient world's great powers. The Hittites became the main competitors of the ancient Egyptian empire during its New Kingdom period. Stuart Manning of Cornell University was the lead writer of the research published in Nature. He said that in ancient times, the Hittites controlled a huge area for hundreds of years, although they faced threats from neighbors and the difficulty of being in a dry area. Scholars long have wondered what caused the fall of the Hittites and the collapse of other civilizations in Greece, Crete, and the Middle East. Ideas have included war and climate change. The new study offers some new ideas about the Hittites. The researchers examined long-lived juniper trees that grew in the area at the time and eventually were used to build a wooden structure about 2,700 years ago. The structure is southwest of Ankara. It might have been the burial place for a family member of Phrygia's King Midas. The trees offered a record of the climate at the time in two ways. First, there are the yearly growth rings in the trees. For example, narrow tree rings suggest dry conditions. Then, there is the ratio of two forms of carbon within the rings. The carbon forms show how the tree dealt with water availability. Researchers discovered a slow change to drier conditions during a period about 3,200 years ago. More importantly, both forms of evidence suggested three straight years of severe drought in 1198, 1197, and 1196 BC. These years are the same as the known timing of the empire's collapse. Study co-writer Britta Lorentzen of the University of Georgia said there was likely near-complete crop failure for three consecutive years. The people most likely had food stores that would get them through a single year of drought. 
but when hit with three consecutive years, there was no food to sustain them. Lorenzen added, This would have led to a collapse of the tax base, and likely a mass movement of people seeking survival. She explained that the Hittites did not have a port or other easy way of moving food into the area. Hattusa, a city protected by a large stone wall, was burned and abandoned. Texts written on clay tablets using the cuneiform writing common in the area did not report what happened. It was a sudden end. Less than one hundred years earlier, the Hittites under King Muatali II and the Egyptians under Pharaoh Ramses II fought the famous Battle of Kadesh in 1274 B.C. The groups reached history's first recorded peace treaty. Study co-writer Jed Sparks of Cornell University said, I think this study really shows the lessons we can learn from history. The climate changes that are likely to occur for us in the next century will be much more severe than those the Hittites experienced. Sparks added that these lessons create questions about our own time. What is our resilience? How much can we withstand? I'm John Russell. Next is a report on higher education from Dan Friedel. Today's program examines the issues facing foreign students who study the sciences and hope to get experience working in the U.S. Dan and Katie Weaver tell us about recent developments that could affect those students. Large technology companies, including Amazon, Google, Meta, and Microsoft, recently announced that they would cut thousands of jobs. The reductions are worrisome for students in the fields of science, engineering, technology, and math, also known as STEM. For international students, the cuts were even more unsettling for those who hope to stay and work in the United States. Under U.S. laws, after finishing school, international students are permitted to work in the country for one year under the Optional Practical Training, or OPT, program. For STEM students, the program extends their work permit for an additional two years in their field of study. Voice of America recently spoke with two students who are working on advanced degrees in technology. The students are finishing their studies this year. Marta Martinez Fernandez is a 27-year-old student from Valencia, Spain. Later this year, she will complete an MBA, or Master of Business Administration, in Interpreting Data at Brandeis University near Boston. Fernandez had an internship, a training position, with a company in California last year. The company, Postman, makes a product that helps computer programs from different companies work together. She said that the company plans to offer her a job. But she said... Some of her classmates who finished their study programs in December are not so lucky. They are unemployed, and their time to find a job is running out. Students in the U.S. on an F-1 visa must find a job within the first 90 days after completing their studies. Some job offers have been withdrawn, Fernandez said, because of the economy. It's definitely made everybody more competitive. It's made everybody more stressed. The market was already competitive like crazy for international students before the tech layoffs happened. I feel like right now it's at a different level that at least I had never witnessed before. Irvin, who did not want to give his full name, is a 27-year-old from Iran. 
He studies the intersection of language and technology at a school in the northeastern U.S. He said he came to study in the U.S. because of the educational quality. He said he risked everything to come to the U.S., hoping for a chance to use his skills. Irvin said there are technology companies in Iran, but there are too many students competing for a small number of jobs. In the U.S., it is the opposite. There are a lot of good jobs for experts in language and technology. Right now, he is applying to do research in a lab at Stanford University in California. If he does not get a job with Stanford, he hopes to work for a company that makes computer programs to help humans speak to machines. Although Irvin believes he will get the research job, he worries when he hears about job reductions at big technology companies. That is because there are more experienced people looking for tech jobs than ever before. Christopher Perello is an assistant professor at Syracuse University's School of Information Studies. He said even students who graduated from Syracuse three or four years ago are asking for help finding new jobs. I'm worried about this, Perello said. Our international students get hurt the most when these layoffs occur. Perello said students in technology studies who planned on working in Silicon Valley might need to consider something different. For example, he said they should look at health care and hospitals because hospitals have experience bringing in workers from other countries. And health care pays very well he said. The other areas he suggested include working on computer systems for airlines or hotels. Those companies work in countries around the world and have experience with international workers. And the third place to look for work would be in higher education. Perello warned students against spending more money just to stay in school in order to stay in the U.S. What you're really doing there is now you're just setting that candidate up for another few years of uncertainty and ambiguity, and that could cause some further mental health challenges or further you know, anxieties with getting other jobs. If Martinez Fernandez's job offer from Postman does not come through, she said she might consider staying in the U.S. and trying to start her own business. For Irvin, if he does not get a good job or research position, he said he is still happy that he came to study in the U.S. I think the biggest risk is to stay stable and not to do anything. Even if it does not work out, Irvin said, he has a great degree he can use in his home country. I'm Dan Friedel. Dan wrote today's education report. Dan, I hope the international students are able to find jobs before they are required to return home. Yes, me too. They all go through a lot of hard work to get into school, get their visa, and then complete their study program. So, Dan, you spoke with two students who have been in the U.S. studying for about two years. How is today's U.S. economy different in comparison to when these students were thinking about coming here for school? Well, Mario, I talked with Marta from Spain. She attended college in the U.S., and then returned to Europe to work for some time. She was working in Spain and France. Then, 
everything closed down because of the pandemic restrictions in 2020 and 2021. So she started thinking about what other skills she needed and decided she would find a business program in the study of data or data analytics. Two years ago, people who were graduating with a degree like that had many job choices. Lots of companies were hiring because more things were being done online, like business, school, and shopping. Now, more people are back to work and school and shopping in person. So it turns out these tech companies have too many workers. I see how that could be a problem. Do you think there is a concern that students who come to the U.S. with the hope of doing OPT have expectations that are too high? Mario, that is a good question. And it came up in my talk with the professor from Syracuse, Christopher Perello. He did say that universities that market themselves to international students should be honest with them and say they will get a great education, but they cannot guarantee they will get a good job right after finishing their study program, especially when it takes two or three years or more to finish school. It's hard to know what the future holds. Thank you, Dan. I think that your report will help a lot of people. You're welcome, Mario. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries are events that we often celebrate with a party. Have you ever noticed how some people love such gatherings while others dislike them just as strongly? And we have names for both kinds. Consider the term party animal, for example. A party animal does not just like parties. They love parties. They are always ready for parties. They seek out parties, and they may throw a lot of parties as well. When a party animal is at such gatherings, they are often the most energetic and enthusiastic of attendees. They are likely to be called the life of the party. That is the person who is best at keeping the party fun and alive. On the other hand, there are people who do not enjoy parties. They do not think such gatherings are fun. This person is a party pooper. When others want to have fun together, they would rather be doing something else. A person can be a party pooper about events other than parties also. Let's say a friend asks you if you want to go for a bicycle ride. You say no. You say it is cold and cloudy and you have too much work to do. Your friend might call you a party pooper as a result. Similar to the party pooper is a Debbie Downer. This is someone who always points out the bad in a situation. The term came into existence in 2004 as the name for a character on the television show Saturday Night Live. A similar meaning word is killjoy, someone who crushes a pleasurable experience. We could also substitute the term buzzkill, 
although it can be anything that destroys a pleasurable situation. For example, rain is a real buzzkill at a parade. We can also say that a negative person dampens the mood of a situation. Dampen literally means to make something wet. Similarly, we can say someone is a wet blanket if they make a situation less enjoyable. And how do we describe the actions of such a person? We say they throw a wet blanket on a situation. Party is both a noun and a verb. When people are very excited about a social event, they might say they want to party down. You can party down at a baseball game, or at a restaurant or dance place. Just remember, often partying down can mean being up all night. So, who are you? Party animal, killjoy, or something else completely? Let us know, and please feel free to celebrate the expressions you are learning from words and their stories. <laughs> <laughs>